Hi, I'm the Space Quest historian. Look, here's the thing about Roberta Williams, okay? People seem to think I have this deep-seated hatred of Roberta Williams. I don't. Quite the contrary, in fact. I fucking love Roberta Williams. If it wasn't for Roberta Williams, I wouldn't be here making this video today. Roberta Williams saw a game in 1970 whenever the fuck, fell in love with it, and convinced her database programming husband Ken to code her a game and add graphics to it. And that last bit, adding graphics, was revolutionary. You have no idea how revolutionary, because it seems so mundane these days, right? I mean, just add some pictures. Come on, how hard can it be? Well, pretty fucking hard, considering the most advanced computer at the time had a fraction of the computing power of most household kitchen appliances today. But she was adamant, and they figured out a way, and thus, Mystery House was born. And if it hadn't been for that game, then we wouldn't have had graphic adventure games as we know them today. The entire trajectory of graphic adventure games can be traced back to that one game. Out of its success came King's Quest. Ron Gilbert saw King's Quest and got jealous, so he made Maniac Mansion in 1987, and thus was seeded the competition of the juggernauts of the early to mid-90s, LucasArts vs. Sierra Online, a competition that for some ass-backwards reason people still treat today as if it was an actual competition, like someone actually came out quote-unquote a winner and a loser. And for the record, the only losers here are the ones who think this is some kind of team sport, and the real winners are the ones who can play and enjoy their games without turning it into the fucking Holy Crusades. But I digress. The point is, if it wasn't for Roberta Williams, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I have nothing but the deepest, most heartfelt respect and admiration for her and her well-deserved legacy. And you can fuck right off with your, well, someone would have thought of it eventually. Yeah, same goes for the light bulb, the telegraph, the printing press, and the roll of toilet paper you need to wipe your mouth with because of all the shit that's pouring out of it. The point is, she did it first. And as adventure game fans, like it or not, we're all still living in the shadows of her legacy. Her legacy as an innovator and her legacy as a pioneer that cannot and should never be impugned. What I take issue with is her legacy as a master storyteller. Because quite frankly, she's not. She's not even a particularly good writer. Her writing in the first five King's Quest games is, if I'm being kind, serviceable, first and foremost. She's not interested in feelings or characters. She's interested in settings, set pieces, and wow factor. Graham sees a mysterious door standing in the middle of a field, and he has absolutely no emotional reaction to it whatsoever. Alexander is captured and thrown in the cargo hold by bloodthirsty pirates and just seems to go, oh well. Rosella sees the fucking undead rise from the ground and make a hungry beeline for her, and she's like, um, could you get out of my way, please? I'm trying to desecrate this grave over here. As an author, Roberta Williams sits back and lets you, the player, inject whatever emotion or motivation into the story that you feel is necessary. And I guess that works from a gameplay perspective, so it's assumed that you, by virtue of simply playing the game, are gonna provide all the incentives needed for the protagonist to reach their end goal. But it also has the distinct side effect of creating a cold, emotionless, barren game world where actions have no emotional consequences and carry no significant weight other than an arbitrary point score. So it is refreshing to see what happens when you hire an actual writer and tell her to make a King's Quest game. And that writer was Jane Jensen, a former systems engineer at Hewlett Packard who was hired at Sierra as a staff writer, mainly to write extra text and dialogue for games like EcoQuest and Police Quest 3, and to write the game manuals. And she was really, really good at it. So good, in fact, that Roberta tapped her to co-design the next King's Quest game with her, which became King's Quest VI, Air today, gone tomorrow. Okay, I see we're still keeping the tradition of the eye roll inducing subtitle puns, that's nice. But how do you build on something that had little to no cohesive mythology to begin with? Well, obviously you take the most obnoxious moment from the ending of the last game, perpetrated by the most obnoxious member of the Daventry royal family, you throw in a huge retcon that falls apart on a close scrutiny, and then you base the entire game around that. It's only been six months since Alexander, hormonal teenage pervert and all-round royal shit-stained son of King 420 and Queen Stockholm Syndrome, saw a slave girl in tattered clothes in a wizard's laboratory and sprang the second most inappropriate boner of his life. That girl was Cassima, princess of the land of the Green Isles, and as we join the opening cutscene of King's Quest VI, a stilted marionette replica of Alexander is sitting on his ass in the throne room, where he has apparently spent the vast majority of his time since getting back to Daventry, pining for the day when said boner could be attended to by a girl he exchanged a grand total of 40 words with. Yes, I counted. And let's be clear here, all she said was, 
perhaps we'll meet again before she was whisked away to her homeland by Crispin the plot convenient wizard, which Alexander apparently interpreted to mean that she was totally DTF and obviously his destined soulmate till death do them part and happily ever after. Jesus fucking Christ, Alex, simmer down. Even his mom is like, dude, you cannot be serious. You talk to her for less than 20 seconds. But Alex is like, fuck you, mom. Get your crotch out of my face. I may have spent the first 17 years on this planet as a slave to a degenerate old child abuser and a pointy head who had me clean out his bowl of piss on a daily basis, and we just got back from spending a couple of days in a glass bottle under threat of death by his asshole wizard brother. But this is by far the greatest agony of my life. So after Valinus leaves her son to console his royal blue balls, the magic mirror decides to show Alexandra a vision of Cassima. New rule, it can apparently also sense whenever someone in the room wants to see something. Or maybe it's just fucking evil and wants the whole royal family dead, as I speculated in my King's Quest 4 video, and I have seen no evidence to the contrary yet. Anyway, wah wah, come find me Alex, I'm in terrible danger, boo hoo, and off Alex fucks. In the Mac intro, it even says his mom lends him the kingdom's flagship. I didn't even know they had one of those, to set sail and find the Green Isles. Now, the problem is, in this game, no one knows where the hell that place is. And as far as we know, Alex's only experience with seafaring vessels was the time he booked passage on a pirate ship, only to be stripped of his belongings and thrown in the hold as their prisoner and or stripling sex slave. Nevertheless, he insists that he'll be able to navigate by the stars he saw outside of Cassie's window, that he only saw for a brief minute and didn't bother writing down, which is patently ridiculous even if he was the most experienced sea captain on the planet. I guess it's somehow reassuring to know that some things never change, Alexander continues to be, and most likely will forever remain, a complete fucking idiot. The only trouble is, his special brand of idiocy gets people killed. After three months of fighting off scurvy and looking at seagulls sniffing each other's butts, Alexander and his crew of three plastic animatronic puppets spot land and immediately crash straight into it. Alex washes up on the shore, but his boat is all smashed to shit, and although he says he hopes his crew made it out alive, it's pretty fucking obvious they didn't. Yeah, I know, fast forward to the ending where Graham and Valinus show up and tell you the crew made it back safely to Daventry. No, 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 I called fucking bullshit on that. There are alternate versions of this intro, which I'll talk about more in the bonus round, but they have additional descriptive text of the storm, and there's talk of whirlpools and storms, like Poseidon himself through a fucking tantrum. The Mac intro calls it a tragedy, and look at the fucking shipwreck on the beach here. There is no way in hell anyone got out of that shit alive. And even if they did, by some miraculous turn of utterly implausible divine intervention, how did they make it back in life rafts after being at sea for three months with no provisions? What, did they eat the chubby guy? Bullshit. Alex and his idiot boner are fucking murderers already, and we haven't even gotten past the intro yet. So, it turns out we've washed up on the land of the Green Isles, which is pretty fucking lucky, considering that's where we wanted to go. Now, before we get into the rest of the game, let me just back up here a little bit. Uh, the game came with this absolutely wonderful guidebook that tells you of the history of the Green Isles, the kingdom, the different islands and their cultures, even some local folklore and myths. And the guidebook is a fantastic read that not only describes the land you're about to explore and sets the stage for the adventure you're about to have, but it also does something absolutely essential that the other previous five games didn't bother with. It does a stunning job of world building. Reading this guidebook makes the place come alive in your imagination, and at the insistence of my Discord, I read the guidebook before I played the game, and that is absolutely the right way to do it. I think Sierra expected you to thumb through this thing while the game was installing, because it really does a fantastic job of setting expectations and piquing your curiosity about what lies ahead. It's written in the words of a dude who, like Alex, washed up on the beach and found himself stuck on the island because the surrounding sea is so treacherous it's essentially impassable, no one ever leaves the Green Isles, and the only people who come here here are those who miraculously survive shipwrecks, but unlike Alex, this guy wasn't a complete bumbling tool, and he describes the land and its five islands as this gorgeous hidden paradise of splendor and wonder, full of kind people and creatures and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and fuck me, I think I just got diabetes. It's a bit of a cheat though, because at the end of the last game, Cosima was like, I live in the land of the Green Isles, and Crispin was like, sure, let me just teleport you straight there, no biggie. But in this game, people talk about the Green Isles like a 
Project fucking Atlantis, shrouded in mystery, hidden behind waters, too violent to pass, blah blah. You think if the place was just a quick teleportation away, at least three rubber crewmen would still be alive today? Or maybe, instead of claiming you can navigate by the stars you saw outside her window, which doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever to begin with, maybe you should have hit up Crispin and asked him to zap you there. Seems like that would be a lot easier than to commandeer a giant galleon and crash it into a beach after three months of pissing around in circles. The whole conceit of the Green Isles being this walled-off paradise that no one can get in and out of smells like an awfully big retcon that really falls apart when you think about it, but I'm actually willing to let it slide because the world-building in the guidebook is just so good. I can't believe I'm saying this, but as I was reading the guidebook, I was actually getting excited to play this game. And then we get into the game itself. So here's Alex, big fat murderer, on the shores of the Isle of the Crown. It's called the Land of the Green Isles plural because it's made up of five islands and they all piss me off, but we'll start with this one. It's home to the castle of the king and queen and more importantly to Alex and his royal libido, Princess Cassima. So off we scoot to meet our future mom and dad-in-law and maybe sneak in a boudoir session with the princess, but psych, turns out the king and queen are dead and Cassima is sequestered in mourning. This hateful prick delivering the news is Vizier al Hazred. No, I refuse to pronounce it Wizier or Wizard or Wazia or however many variants the voice actors throw at this word. If we can't come to a consensus, I'm just gonna settle on Wizzy Poo. Vizier. So Ali the Wizzy Poo here has assumed command of the land in the royal couple's death-induced absence, and he plans to solidify this not at all suspicious power play by shacking up in holy matrimony with Cassie. And he straight up tells us to fuck off. Although I don't quite know how he expects us to journey home, seeing as you only have to step out three feet into the water before the water instantly sucks you under and carries you off to your death. Meanwhile, Alex, being unforgivably dense, senses nothing out of the ordinary from this whole encounter, not even from this dude in the background with the glowing yellow eyes, and humbly apologizes for wasting everybody's time before leaving. Now, if you're a more observant person than me, you'll remember back in King's Quest V where Cassima straight up told Graham that her parents were partying down with an evil vizier who just so happened to be a friend of Mordax. Gee, you think she might mean this mustache twirling dipshit here? Now, it would have made sense for Graham to at least have passed on this minor detail to his son before the little twat commandeered the kingdom's flagship and sailed it straight into the ground, but daddy's probably off somewhere on a massive fairy dust bender or something because he was certainly conspicuously absent from that intro. All 17 million variations of it, I promise I'll get to that. So, no points for guessing that Twirly McTurban Stash here is our main antagonist. In fact, he's quite cleverly, or so he thinks, caused all the five neighboring islands to get very mad at each other by stealing some of their shit and blaming it on each other, and this is supposed to help him in some way? I'm not entirely sure how. Something about them being too busy squabbling so he could take over the kingdom, at least according to this evil letter of evil you find near the end of the game, but I don't know why he would need to do any of that, since they all seem to be super loyal to the throne anyway, regardless of what bag of turds may be sitting in it. Maybe this is just how he gets his kicks. And of course he did kill the royal couple. In fact, he snuck into their bedroom while they were sleeping and stabbed them to death like a VIPER! Sorry, I just had to get that in there. And why he even wants to rule over this land in the first place while everyone's super pissy and at each other's throats, I don't know either. It's not like this is a bustling economy or a valuable strategic outpost or even a particularly attractive tourist spot. It's just five islands populated by dimwits, narcissists, and LSD hallucinations come to life. You set foot anywhere near this dude's cursed garden on the Isle of the Beast and you have about 10 minutes before you turn into a whooping terrier. You climb this cliffside of copy protection bullshit on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain only to be scowled at by a pair of winged cock muppets who repay your efforts by tossing you in their catacomb maze to be eaten by a minotaur they can't be bothered to clear out. And if you're somehow able to get to the Isle of Mists, you're instantly welcomed by a death squad of hooded shit gobblers who toss your ass in a cage and roast you alive. And then there's the Isle of Wonder. Oh my fucking god, there are no words in the English language that can adequately describe how much I hate every fucking square inch of this place. It's basically Alice in Wonderland, full of whimsy and non sequiturs and brightly colored bullshit. It's where all of Jane Jensen's worst puns and dumbfuck linguistic jokes suddenly sprouted legs and started talking to you. There's the two chessboard queens who squabble over a piece of coal and a rotten egg. Don't ask why, it's not supposed to make sense. There's the anthropomorphic bookworm who's lost his dangling participle, which happens to be this 
weird little caterpillar creature that doesn't speak in dangling participles, so fuck you, you rotten little snot. There's a black widow who's just a stereotypical femme fatale, quite literally, and boy do they milk this eight-legged little bitch for every dead husband joke they can. And then there are these five fucking obnoxious gnomes who represent each of the five senses, smell, sound, taste, touch, and sight, and they can all go to hell. For one, they're just there to cockblock you from exploring the island until you've shoved five inventory items in their faces, and they never appear again. And second, most egregiously of all, they speak in rhymes. Rhymes. Oh god, I wish I could set each and every one of them on fire and then sit back and laugh my ass off as they each try to come up with a clever verse meter to adequately convey the horrors of their flesh melting from their bones before their lungs turn black. Everything on this island is full of try-hard whimsy and dumb fuckery and it can all go fuck itself. So Alexander piddles around for a bit, visits each of these islands, and either annoys the inhabitants or just robs them blind, and finally he makes his way into the castle to stop the wedding between Wizzypoo and Cassie. But it's not actually Cassie at all, it's the wizard's pet genie, Shamir Shamazel, a name that's so ridiculous I don't even need to make a joke about it. Now, this magical dingbat has been trailing us since the start of the game, but he's super inept at it. Once Wizzy Poo knows we're in town, he sends Shamir off to make sure we get into a fatal accident somehow. Why he doesn't just outright kill us is anybody's guess. Anyway, here he is posing as a young boy, a gardener, a wizened old levitating crone, and a not at all conspicuous looking dude in a black cloak. Not to mention a host of specimens from the animal kingdom, including this snake, this raven, and this weird little possum thing. It's supposed to be a weasel, according to the King's Quest Wiki, and sure, whatever you say. I mean, when have they ever been wrong? And I'll admit, the first time he tries to lure us into our death by posing as a little boy in the ocean, that's nice, in a suitably creepy way, but after that, he's just a one-trick pony, and you can smell his bullshit coming a mile away, especially because no matter what form he assumes, he still has eyes that look like he just entered the invulnerability cheat code in Doom. And for some reason he's addicted to mints, which gets him super drunk? I don't know, it's apparently his way of coping with being this snot monkey's enslaved servant. I think it's supposed to be funny. Anyway, once you interrupt this lovely ceremony between an evil racist stereotype and his pet genie, which, side note, begs the question why Wheezy Poo even bothered keeping Kasima alive for the several months he's been cooking up this scheme, if his genie can just impersonate her to such a convincing degree that it fools the castle guards who have known her all their lives, but anyway, one of two things can happen. Either you played the game on the short path and Mission impossible your way inside, posing as a serving wench, in which case you run up to the happy couple and flash a mirror of truth in Shizzle's face, exposing him for the giggling magical shitbird that he is. If you're playing on the long path, however, Cassie's recently deceased parents burst through the door and loudly proclaim that that's not their daughter, that's just some weirdo who never puts on a shirt, and <laughs> did I forget to mention, as a minor little side quest, you can travel all the way to the land of the fucking dead and bargain with the Lord of Death himself for the release of Cassie's parents back into the realm of the living. That's a hell of a wedding present, isn't it? And you do this by flashing the aforementioned Mirror of Truth at Death, reminding him of what a wretched, lonely, eternally fucked creature he is, making him shed a single grey tear. How fucking metal is that? Don't get me wrong, it's also wildly out of place in a game that also has a scene where a talking stick and a log throw swamp muck at each other, but this whole bit with showing Death a mirror that holds up the truth of his tormented existence and forcing him to look at it, it's just so fucking badass, I'm legit impressed. The writing is beautiful too. The mirror's surface swirls with darkness for a moment, then fills with images even blacker. Reflections of despair, of wailing souls, of shackles colder and more immutable than any forged by man, of a world of thirsts that can never be quenched. His is an existence that has no possibility of redemption, no end. How fucking killer is that? It is, of course, slightly diminished by the silly dance number in front of this giant sphincter door that happens only minutes prior, or this wildly inappropriate dance music that kicks in right after you've humiliated death in the Amiga version. Either way, back in the throne room, Wizzy Poo's plan is just crumble around him, so off he fucks out the back door to... Uh, that's not entirely clear, actually. He runs up the stairs to the tower where he's got the real Cassie under wraps, literally, at least I think those are ropes she's trying to undo. Maybe she's just having a minor seizure and all the excitement. And I don't know what he was planning to do up here because it's a dead end and his genie's occupied downstairs fighting off a horde of loyal guards who at this point have finally caught on to the notion that old Ali here and his yellow-eyed goon might be a bit suspect. 
Speaking of said goon, the genie then pops up and you can either kill him by getting him drunk on a peppermint leaf, or if you've gone the extra mile and stolen his lamp, you can command him to stop being an asshole and fuck off back into his bottle. Both of these solutions piss me off because they rely entirely on information that's shown to you in cutscenes where Alex isn't present, which just creates this massive disconnect between the player and the protagonist and makes Alex appear downright clairvoyant. There's no way in hell he would know what the genie's lamp looked like because he wasn't in the goddamn room when the game showed it to us, but nevertheless he somehow picks out the exact right one from this lamp salesman, yeah, fuck you. And sure he saw the genie get buzzed on a tic tac in the pawn shop that one time, but he didn't know it was the genie at the time, so this genie business is bullshit either way. And then, blah blah, epic sword fight with the villain that's only hampered slightly in its grandiose aspirations by the fact that Alexander once again demonstrates an astonishing absence of mental acuity by entering into a fight with a sword that's twice the size and three times as heavy as him. Kasima then finally decides to join the party and lend a hand by stabbing Wizzy Poo in the shoulder, giving Alex enough time to brain him over the head with the non-lethal end of the sword, and the two teenage lovers embrace and exchange a generous amount of saliva, despite, and I hate to bring this up again, having only known each other for a combined total of 10 minutes. But apparently that's all it takes to back yourself a princess, because not only does she succumb to Alexander's fairly creepy request to give him more than her gratitude, ew, but she also accepts his offer of marriage on the spot. Hot damn, Cassie. You ever heard of slowing things down and taking your time? Maybe get to know the dude first and make sure he doesn't take after his dad and has a crippling drug addiction? Or even more pressingly, has unresolved incestuous feelings towards his sister? Maybe he has a trauma-induced sexual dysfunction whereby he can only achieve an erection if you dress up as a hundred-year-old wizard and piss in a chamber pot. Cause from this point on, life takes off at about 5,000 miles per hour for the two lovebirds. Within a week, they're tying the knot and are bestowed the keys to the kingdom as the new ruling king and queen. Again, depending on what path you took to get here, that means they either inherit an island paradise full of rhyming gnomes and lamp salesmen, or a kingdom where everyone is at each other's throat and on the brink of civil war. And let's be clear here, these kids are about 18, maybe 19 tops, because Alexander was 17 when he came back to Daventry, and I may be wrong on this, but I think I read somewhere that a year passed between King's Quest 4 and 5, so maybe if we're being generous and say Alex had a birthday in those 6 months that passed between 5 and 6, then he might have turned 19. So he's still a kid. And we're not explicitly told how old Cassie is, but I'm willing to bet she's around the same age as Alex. So essentially, we're leaving the fate of this kingdom and its recovery from bitterness and rivalry in the hands of two high school kids who just played tonsil hockey next to an unconscious psychopath and a squad of anthropomorphic dogs. Yeah, this'll turn out splendidly, I'm sure. Now, if you went the route where you kept the genie, then he magically fixes everything for you and also teleports your parents in from Daventry to attend the wedding. However, keeping the genie also means taking a very long route through the game, and it means you have to befriend and then suffer through the companionship of this dopey fuck, Jollo the Royal Jester, who sounds like a stoned goofy and insists on wearing his curly shoes everywhere he goes. And honestly, I'm not sure that's worth it. Not only that, but as I mentioned before, Graham and Valinus bullshit us into thinking our crew of animatronic robots robots made it back safely to Daventry, which is just a crock of horseshit. Honestly, Dad, you couldn't stay off the smack even for my wedding day? Come on. So that's the story in a nutshell. How's the gameplay? Well, it's a King's Quest game, so there's of course the prerequisite dose of obtuse moon logic, unfair timer events, dead man walking scenarios, and our new friend, the most blatant of all artificial extensions of gameplay time, mazes. It's not the worst in the series, but there are some real travesties in here. By far the most unforgivable of these are the dead man walking situations, because so many of them can all be traced back to this wretched pawn shop dude. This guy has four items on his counter, all of which he'll gladly trade back and forth, but you can only keep one at a time. Why? No reason other than to piss you off. There's no way of knowing which item you'll need when you set out and look for something to do, and many times you'll get stuck in a situation, say trapped in a dark room inside this catacomb with a hungry murderous minotaur on your ass, and you'll wish you'd brought a light. But how are you supposed to know that upon arriving on this cliffside, these dick twisters would immediately toss you into the catacombs? Oh sure, if you haven't got the light on you, they let you scoot off and get supplies first, but you don't know that you need light until you've gone through half the goddamn catacomb maze already. And that's even if you get that far, because before that you also need to remember to bring this brick from the wall on an entirely different island and shove it in this Indiana Jones contraption, otherwise Alex gets squashed into a gooey mess of hair and pulverized teeth. Oh, and this dude has the worst business sense ever, because even after you've taken the tinderbox for a spin to light up this cavern in this dark, musty room in the catacombs, he'll gladly take it back and swap it for a new item. 
Dude, we just spent all the fucking candles in it. I mean, that's mighty generous of you, sure, but you're probably the worst pawn shop owner in the history of forever. By far the biggest disconnect in terms of story versus puzzles, for me at least, was this Cliffs of Logic bullshit. You climb the side of this cliff by going up these precarious steps and solving a series of puzzles along the way that aren't really puzzles at all, and they certainly aren't logical. What this is is essentially a reading comprehension test because every answer to these puzzles is in the guidebook that came with the game, and I hesitate to even call this copy protection because the answers to the puzzles are always the same, so once you get them right the first time you can just write them down, or if you're Adventure OT level 8 you can just memorize them and never have to look at the manual again. But the thing that bothers me is, from a story perspective, how does Alex know any of this shit? It's clear that he's never read the guidebook himself. The guidebook is even in the game itself, inside this chest in the castle, and the narrator snidely remarks that this would probably have come in handy if Alex had bothered reading it before coming here. And all the puzzles on this dumb fucking mountain requires extensive knowledge of the history and folklore of these winged dick squeezers. So how the fuck did Alex manage to scale this thing? Did he just guess all all the right answers, including this baffling code cipher which shows up twice, or this Duke Nukem 3D style button combination whose solution lies in this old riddle poem. And while we're on the subject, if you're gonna set up a character like the Winged One's Oracle as this mystical being whose very existence is so shrouded in mystery that many of the Winged Ones themselves believe her to be nothing more than a fairy tale, and then once you come out of the catacombs they go, oh by the way you've won an audience with the Oracle like it's a free car on the Oprah show, and she apparently just lives on top of this mountain that's freely accessible to anyone with a pair of wings, which is every goddamn person on the island, that kinda kills the mystique a bit fellas. And speaking of the catacombs, look, I'm sorry to keep going on about the Isle of the Sacred Shit stains here, but they just really piss me off. This minotaur that's been living in your catacombs for centuries. The guidebook describes it as this towering, fearsome creature who threatened to lay waste to their whole society if they didn't promise to feed it an annual living sacrifice. And this is the fearsome minotaur. This is the scourge of the land, the undefeatable, flesh-munching menace that has tormented your kingdom for untold generations. Come on guys, what kind of a fucking petting zoo are you running here? He's pint sized! He's almost adorable! You're telling me you've got an army of these spear throwing snot goblins that can fly and you can't set aside an afternoon to clear out your catacombs of one measly little billy goat? How about you vigorously lather my sphincter? Okay, I think that about does it. Time for the bonus round. King's Quest VI came out in 1992 on floppy disks for DOS and a year later in 1993 on CD-ROM for DOS, Windows and Macintosh. There are very few notable differences between the floppy and CD-ROM versions gameplay-wise, except for these gaudy mustard-colored text boxes from the floppy version which they mercifully toned down for the CD-ROM version. Of course the CD-ROM version also has all the in-game dialogue voiced and this time they actually went to the trouble of hiring actual voice actors. I mean fuck, Robbie Benson, the guy who voiced the beast in Disney's Beauty and the Beast is the voice of Prince Alexander, and lord help him, he tries his best, but even great writing and a talented voice actor can't save the character of Alexander of Daventry from forever being the world's biggest fucking moron. A year later again in 1994 a version for the Commodore Amiga was released. This version is really interesting in that it wasn't made by Sierra at all, in fact it doesn't even run in Sierra's game engine SCI like all the other versions. See, after the abysmal failures of trying to convert games like Space Quest 4 and King's Quest 5 for the Amiga, Sierra begrudgingly realized that SCI just performed like pure unbridled ass on the Amiga. It was slow, had monstrously long load times, and the games were terribly ugly to boot. So ugly in fact that it sent us down a bit of a nerdy rabbit hole over on my SQH Discord, because particularly King's Quest 5 and Space Quest 4 were so ugly we had to look deeper into just how badly screwed up they were. King's Quest 5 has some spots where it's okay, but it gets really really rough to look at the further you get into the game. Space Quest 4 just looks like a bag of turds with an extra serving of turd on the side. Now, you may already know that the standard Amiga display can only show 32 colors at once, whereas if you had a VGA card on your DOS PC, you could have 256 colors on the screen at once. And since Sierra viewed the DOS PC as their primary development platform, that meant that these games were created with a 256 color display in mind, and they would then have to be downscaled to 32 colors for their Amiga versions. Now, normally you can get away with some pretty decent results by swapping out which 32 colors to use in any given screen. This is a technique known as palette swapping. Uh, so you'd essentially pick a new palette of optimal colors for every screen of the game. And while the Space Quest 1 remake on the Amiga does that and gets some fairly decent results out of it, King's Quest 5 and Space Quest 4 on the other hand doesn't do that. They use the same palette for every single screen of the game, which is a technique known as we're lazy and don't give a fuck so let's just get the shit out the door so our boss will stop yelling at us. 
Add to that that the SCI engine really wasn't optimized to run on the Amiga. Every review we could find of King's Quest V and Space Quest IV and the Space Quest I remake all complain about slowdowns and long loading times, and Sierra rather wisely decided to stop porting their games to the platform after Space Quest IV. That is, until a little-known British game developer by the name of Revolution Software stepped in and offered to do the conversion of King's Quest VI for the Amiga. And if the name sounds familiar, then yes, it is the same Revolution Software that would go on to create Beneath the Steel Sky and Broken Sword. In fact, what they did for King's Quest VI wasn't so much a conversion as they literally stripped the game apart, threw out Sierra's SCI engine, and rebuilt the whole fucking thing from scratch in their own game engine. So yes, King's Quest VI for the Amiga runs in the same game engine as Lure of the Temptress and Beneath the Steel Sky. And what an improvement! The game loads much faster, and Revolution sure know what the hell they were doing in terms of graphics, because even though this is still just 32 colors, it looks much better than whatever the hell this is supposed to be. There are some funny differences between the two. Apparently Revolution were working off an earlier version of King's Quest VI, so it has some slightly different dialogue in places. The funniest of these is that if you get the genie on your side, in the PC version al Hazred knocks the lamp out of Alex's hand with his sword. In the Amiga version, and presumably in earlier drafts of the PC version, Alexander, in a fit of boner-induced hubris, chucks the fucking lamp down the stairs and says, I don't need a genie to fuck you up, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> right, Alex, I hope you like shish kebab, because you're about to become one you dim-witted little prick. Also, I hate to say this, but the genie's a lot cooler in this version. In the PC version, they practically beat you over the head with his yellow eyes that glint and sparkle, and every time he's on screen in one of his disguises, he disappears in a puff of smoke after a short while if you ignore him. Which the narrator, echoing Alexander's extremely limited mental prowess, simply describes as odd in a maybe they just went away when you weren't looking kind of way, instead of DUDE, THAT GARTNER JUST TELEPORTED OFF THE FACE OF THE EARTH WHILE YOU WERE STARING RIGHT AT HIM! But in the Amiga version, he doesn't disappear right away. And because of the limited color palette, his eyes aren't always sparkling bright yellow. So actually, his presence in the Amiga version is much more sinister because he doesn't give himself away instantly, and they cut out his most ridiculous appearance, which is this old woman on the top of the mountain who suggests you eat nightshade to gain the power of flight, which she then demonstrates by flapping around like a balloon for a bit. Any sane person would have grabbed his dumb ass and let him teleport himself to safety in midair from being tossed off the cliffside, but no, Alex just has another, hmm, that's odd moment. Fucking imbecile. Yes, both of them. Anyway, I'm nearly done, but let's talk about the intro. So, by my count, there are a grand total of five different versions of this intro, and they're all different in some way. There's the original PC floppy intro, which is fully voiced, but not by the professional actors from the CD-ROM version. This has an entirely different voice cast, but the dialogue is the same as the CD-ROM intro. The floppy intro is also less animated, of course, but it also has this, for the time at least, spiffy, if slightly dizzying, merry-go-round shot of the throne room. But if you play either of these versions in 16 color EGA, then you get a different intro. Since Sierra's video player was only designed to run in 256 color VGA, the EGA version does things slightly differently. It's just static text on a black background. But it also offers more descriptions of the events and slightly different dialogue than the voiced intro. Interestingly, if you run the CD-ROM version in 16 colors and view the intro, it's silent like the floppy version, but the actors actually did record their lines for this text-only intro, and they're in the game's resource files. The programmers just didn't bother actually putting them into the game. Until finally, on a day like every other day at sea, as the young prince searches through his spyglass, he sights land. And then there's the Amiga version, which is more or less just a cut-down version of the PC floppy intro. The dialogue is a little different, but not remarkably so. But then we have the Macintosh version, which doesn't have any voiceover, but is still fully animated, and has a very different narration and dialogue from either the PC VGA or PC EGA intros. In this one, Prince Alexander is called a young man obsessed, yeah, I believe you, and it's also this version that says Queen Valinus lends him the royal flagship on his quest to find his prince's booty, which it doesn't say in any other version. Anyway, I think that about does it for this video. King's Quest VI is certainly not the worst game I've ever played, and the different paths and puzzle solutions that affect the outcome of the ending are certainly welcome, because I enjoy a game that plays with the medium, and adventure games by their very nature as an interactive medium certainly benefits from being non-linear and having more than one possible outcome. What works against this approach in King's Quest VI is that you actually have a bit too much freedom to explore, so the game frequently has to corner you into sections like this catacomb maze, or throw cock blocks at you like these sense gnomes, just to make sure you have everything you need to progress and don't completely derail the story. 
And even then, it still has a bunch of dead man walking scenarios where you can get yourself stuck in an unwinnable state and have to start over from a previous point. On the upside, the writing has certainly improved over the previous games because, you know, Jane Jensen is an actual writer. And as you probably already know, she would go on to design and write the first Gabriel Knight game a year later, a game that's just honestly phenomenally brilliant, and you can see a lot of precursor elements to Gabriel Knight in King's Quest VI, like this maze where you get periodic reminders that something is after you, or the way she uses less than greater than signs to denote non-verbal sounds like grunts and sighs, or the third-person narration that'll make you absolutely sick of hearing the protagonist's name before you're a third of the way through the game. Alexander. 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 On the downside, I have to just briefly talk about the graphics for a bit because honestly, they're pretty shit. King's Quest V was a much better looking game than this. In King's Quest VI, all the backgrounds look washed out and have really poorly defined detail, whereas King's Quest V was pretty crisp and colorful. But where King's Quest VI really takes a nose dive is in the animation department. Sierra were apparently so proud of the fact that they could videotape actors and then trace over them that they forgot that this process was intended to enhance the realism of the characters' movements, not detract from it. The characters all have really, really few frames of animation, and their limbs sometimes seem to stretch weirdly and awkwardly. I mean, look at Alexander's arm here when he's holding out an item for Cassie's nightingale. Or this gaudy-ass sprite of Alexander with his lit torch that just looks like a terrible video capture running at two frames per second. Even the fully animated characters look weird. I mean, what the hell are these chessboard queens doing exactly? Are they headbutting each other? I'm sorry, but this is just awful. Look, here's what rotoscoping is supposed to look like. And here's King's Quest VI. I rest my case. So that's it for everybody's favorite King's Quest game. Sure, I didn't hate it, and the writing and story were miles ahead of any of the previous games, even if it did star the most insufferable member of the royal family of Daventry, but coming off the heels of the piss-poor plotting and puzzle design of the previous five games, it's hard to see this as anything other than an improvement on most fronts. It still has some terrible flaws, both in terms of story and gameplay, some that I can overlook, some that are just downright unforgivable, and some that are just the result of weak retconning that they hope no one who had played the previous games would notice. But there's no rest for the wicked. King Graham is still my prisoner, and I won't let him out until I've played all of the King's Quest games through. Now, luckily, thanks to the awesome generosity of everyone on my Patreon, I can now happily say that this will indeed happen. We've reached the final goal of 650 bucks a month, which means I will be playing through all of King's Quest 7 and Mask of Eternity, and then your king will be free. But please do go have a look at my Patreon if you haven't already. There are always more games to play and more Sierra series that I've always wanted to take a crack at. I mean, did you know I've always wanted to be a cop? Actually, that's not true, but with your help, I just might get to play as one once we're done with all the King's Quest games. So I do hope you'll join me for that and consider supporting my efforts to ruin everyone's childhoods on Patreon. Don't forget to follow me on Twitch, where I live stream my playthroughs of these games, and on my Bandcamp page, where you can download the soundtracks to these videos. And a big massive thanks to the weirdos on my SQH Discord for helping me with this video with a bunch of fact checking and footage grabbing and code spelunking. I'm the Space Quest Historian. Thank you so much for watching. Girl in the Tower is a terrible song and I hate it, and I'll see you around the Chrono Stream. Bye.